Welcome, I'm Leith Davis. I'm the director of the Research Center for Scottish Studies, and we're so happy to hear you see you here in person. Thanks so much for coming down. And I think traffic was pretty crappy today, wasn't it? Yeah. So thank, thanks to all of you who who um, yes came down despite all odds. So really, really pleased that you could join us. Um, I want to start with just a land acknowledgement <coughs> that Simon Fraser University um, is a place that we work and we live, and it is on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, so the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Musqueam peoples, and um, we're very grateful to be able to live in this space and to inhabit this area. Um, I also want to start with some thanks. So big thanks to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences for helping funding this event, and also to the Department of English, and to the Research Center for Scottish Studies. And um, those of you who aren't familiar with our center and who'd like to know more about it, please see me afterwards. I'm help, happy to help you uh, learn more about it. We are a center that, that takes our research and joins with the research from the community. Um, we fund students, and we're funding a project right now that is investigating the um, Jacobite memories of women and um, Gallic speakers and labor class individuals. So we're working on a manuscript with the National Library of Scotland to try and find those hidden voices and to bring them to light. So I'm happy to speak at length with you if you'd like to know more about that. But you're here today, I know, to hear Holly and to hear Sharon, and so am I. And so I'm just going to introduce them to you. Um, let me just ask for another hand of applause for our musicians. There is uh, Heidi on the harp there, Heidi and um, Claire, who is playing with the recorder, Rob, who is playing the octave mandolin, and Ken is joining on the drums. So thanks very much. to introduce to you um, Sharon and Holly. Dr. Sharon Alker is Mary Denny Professor of English and General Studies at Whitman College in Washington. And Holly Faith Nelson is Professor of English. Um, um, she's also the English Stream Coordinator for the MI, MA in Interdisciplinary Humanities and co-director of the Gender Studies Institute at Trinity Western University. And they are sisters. Literally. <laughs> and and, and <laughs> uh, They were born in the lowlands of Scotland and they emigrated with their family to Canada in the 1970s. Were you guys alive at that point? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very. Hard okay. to <laughs> just, just babies. Just babies and embryos, yeah. While both published in a range of areas, Scottish studies is closest to their heart. Between them, they have published on Scottish writers such as John Arbuthnot, Robert Burns, uh, Mary Brunton, James Hogg, and John Galt. And their monograph, dun, 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 <laughs> Besieged Early Modern British Siege Literature, 1642 to 1722, was recently published by Queen's University Press, and they are currently working on an article on Scottish siege or Scottish writers engaged with siege literature, which I'm assuming this research is part of. So we're really looking forward to hearing this. Can I also say that they are alumni of Simon Fraser University, and um, so proud of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we look forward to it. Thank you. Our mother said we had to go to Simon Fraser because it was a Scottish university. <laughs> <laughs> I got into UBC as well. But <laughs> Much uh, for coming and uh, the center. Thank you to the center for research on Scottish studies for inviting us. Um, as we're getting older, our heritage is becoming even more important to us. As we're, you know, going on to ancestry.ca and exploring our roots and uh, reviewing our connection with Scotland. So it was such an honor to be invited by the center. And uh, what, how we're going to do give the papers, I'm going to give the historical backdrop of it. And um, 
one of the books I was very dependent on, in case you're interested, is this tiny little uh, a Military History of Scotland, which is actually so enjoyable to read, strangely enjoyable to read. And it looks very expensive. It's Oxford University Press, but it's only about $40. See, the Scottish. <laughs> My dad used to, um, I'd ask him to lend, you know, if you lend me money, and he'd pull out a cord and say, oh, you can have this. <laughs> <laughs> We're used to uh, being very careful with our funds. So, and then after I talk about the history, Sherry will talk about the literature and the siege literature that we're interested in. And if, if you um, are, if you like pictures like I do, we're, we're trying to show illustrations as we go along. The fear of being besieged and preparing to defend oneself is a powerful instinct of self-preservation. The notion of being penetrated by a harmful foreign body in various forms runs throughout history. In fact, over time, humans developed a siege mentality, which the Oxford English Dictionary defines as a defensive or paranoid attitude of mind based on an assumption of hostility in others. For those of us living in 21st century Britain and North America, where literal sieges are now a rarity, we argue over the possibility of besiegement by disease, migrants, criminals, information, market forces, and more. However, for those in earlier societies, siege mentality was mostly directed at literal military sieges, which posed a dire threat to their communities. Such was certainly the case in Scotland. What we typically envision as a Scottish siege involving castles did not occur until about the 12th century in Scotland. Castles were not involved in Scottish sieges until those Anglo-Normans introduced them to Scotland. But sieges of a more primitive type still took place even in prehistoric Scotland. This conclusion is based on traces left on the Scottish landscape. Hill forts of different scales and types were the most common in the Late Bronze Age and the Early Iron Age, along with enclosed sites on knolls and promontories. These structures continued on into the early medieval period. Based on archaeological digs, it appears that some had palisades or fences of denuded trees. Denuded just means they were nude. <laughs> and some included ramparts, types of defensive walls, and ditches. Scholars find it hard to tell, however, whether the remains of these sites are enclosures to protect the Scots, Picts, or the Britons from sieges, to create a sense of community within them, or to display one's power. It is likely that all three were the case. Here's an example from the late Iron Age, or the early medieval period, Tackle North in Aberdeenshire, near the village of Rinney. Anybody been there to Tackle North? Well, there's a place to go on your holiday <laughs> summer vacation. Uh, academics have recently, just in the past few years, claimed that there were two hill forts at Tackle North, a higher and a lower, and that it is the largest Pictish site ever discovered in Scotland in total 16.75 hectares, estimating that it possibly contained up to 800 homes or huts with 4,000 people living there. While a late bronze or early Iron Age fort might have been there first, thereafter in the fifth and sixth centuries AD, a major settlement was established. Scholars from the University of Aberdeen estimates that thousands resided in the hill fort protected from marauders and pillagers. I hate those marauders and pillagers are everywhere. <laughs> the historian James Fraser suggests that bloodless standoffs, more than bloody sieges, might have taken place in such locations, concluding that rather than relentless assaults, sieges might be concluded by forging of some kind of formal understanding by the protagonists who faced one another across the ramparts, or across the water between a besieged island and the mainland. After all, he writes, storming a stronghold was a high-risk tactic of the first order and could lead to massacres. So negotiation might work out better. When most of us think of sieges in Scotland, it is in the medieval world that comes to mind. 
especially those fought during the wars of independence. Oh, we're trying to get away from the English. I apologize if you're English. I may have a dash of English myself. Rather ironically, at this time, Scottish castles were more of a military detriment than a benefit to the Scots, since the English worked hard to capture and garrison them. As the historian Michael Presswich explains, when it came to sieges, medieval Scots were at a disadvantage since they lacked the capacity for traditional siege warfare and had few siege engines to deploy. Presswich and others insist, however, that despite the limitations in siege technology, the Scots could be especially canny, and we are, really, <laughs> achieving astounding success in taking English-held castles using equipment no more um, complicated or sophisticated than rope ladders. One of the Scottish strategies for preventing the English taking control of their castles was, unfortunately for us, to destroy those castles in whole or in part once they had recovered them, which Robert I, or Robert the Bruce, did at, for example, in Rennes in 1307. The Scots could be just as crafty as the Greeks at Troy when faced with siege warfare. In the historical, albeit very biased, chronicle the Bruce, uh, John Barber recalls that Robert the Bruce's ally, Sir, George, um, Sir James Douglas, cleverly took back Douglas Castle in 1313 by suddenly attacking the garrison when many of his members left the castle to attend the local church on Palm Sunday. Not very nice, but it was, it was canon. <laughs> Barber's account of Douglas's taking of rocks for a castle, which as we will see later fueled the Scottish imagination, highlights even more the wit of the Scot in besieging castles. This is how the um, barber describes it. I'll put on a bad Scottish accent for it. Uh, James of Douglas set all his wit to discover how, by any craft or stratagem, rocks were to be taken. A lengthy cause Sim of Lethouse, a crafty and skin, skillful man, to make ladders of hemp and ropes with wooden steps, so bound that they should in no way break. The device had made a hook of iron, strong and square, which if once fixed on a battlement with the ladder straightly stretched from it, it could hold it securely. As soon as this was devised and done, the Lord of Douglas in secret gathered trusty men. They covered all the armor they wore with black frocks. Soon they came near the castle, then they sent all their horses back and went along the path in single file on hands and feet, as if they were cows and oxen that had been left out unsecured. The men in the garrison supposed that Douglas and his men were oxen because they went on their hands and feet, always one by one. Douglas's men sped swiftly to the wall and soon set up their ladders. When the garrison heard that Douglas was there, they were dismayed and set up no right defense. Douglas's men slew them without mercy till they got the upper hand, and the garrison, fearing death beyond measure, fled seeking safety. And the ones that did manage, they burned in the basement um, alive. And they call it the, something larger as a result, the, the people who still live there. The Siege of Roxburgh occurred not long before the Battle of Bannockburn, which Michael Brown writes had a significance that went well beyond Scotland. It is one of a group of later medieval combat events whose reality and subsequent mythology acquired a, spe a special place in the identity of a nation since it represented a victory against the odds for a small community facing defeat, subjection, and loss of sovereignty at the hands of a more powerful neighboring realm. How many of you have heard of the Battle of Bannockburn? Yes, you know, it's in our memories, because it's traveled all the way to Canada. Although the use of artillery during later sieges was much more sophisticated than it was during the 14th century, David Caldwell's research into the Scots and guns reveals that the Scots used engines of war during the Wars of Independence. As a case in point, Caldwell recalls that at the Siege of Stirling Castle in 1304, Edward I had a narrow escape from a spiculum, which is a bolt, fired from a springold in the castle. By the, 16th, uh, by the 1340s, there is at least one record of the Scots using cannons when besieging Scott Stirling Castle. And by the mid-14th century, a contemporary chronicler describes Scots using a siege chain consisting of excellent great machines such as cannon and artillery and gunpowder, carts and carriages, among other tools of war. 
Because of developments in technology, by the time we reach the 17th century civil war, or the war of the three kingdoms, we Scots like to call it, the use of artillery during sieges was far more sophisticated. This was even more disturbing since family members were often on opposite sight of the siege machines, causing these wars to remain deeply etched on the memories of those who lived through them. Even the behead, after the beheading, oh, please come in. Yes, just find it, see, and make yourself comfortable. Even after the beheading of Charles I in 1649, there remained many monarchists in Scotland working to, together to put Charles II on the throne. So Oliver Cromwell, who I have a great dislike for, I don't know why, Lord Protector and his generals, including George Monk, later commander-in-chief of the English forces in Scotland, sought to uh, finish them off. Monk was a committed parliamentarian in 1651 when he led the siege of Dundee, which um, Charles Maxwell calls the last and certainly the most destructive siege that occurred in this town. Based on 17th century records and journals of the event, Maxwell writes that Monk began to cannonade the town, while twice offering town leaders terms of surrender. When they resisted, the town was taken by storms, the walls were demolished, and the Republican soldiers rushed in furiously among the inhabitants. The carnage which ensued, Maxwell laments, was an indelible <coughs> stigma on Monk. Maxwell claims that the number of persons put to death is estimated at not much less than six part of the population in, in, in the city, or nearly 1,300 individuals, including 200 women and children, and two ministers, and many persons of the highest rank were taken prisoner. Later scholars estimated that the number of casualties were lower. Only 600 times people were butchered, they said. If many of the battles and sieges of the War of the Three Kingdoms have been forgotten by Scots, this is less true for those fought during the Jacobite Risings of 1715 and 1745. Few Scots, uh, um, for instance, have not heard of which battle? Culloden. <laughs> yeah, how many of you have heard of the Battle of Culloden? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's the, the best one, which was fought in April 1746 which our late Victorian grandmother, she was born in 1888, her grandma, she lived almost 100 years, uh, still cried over in the mid 20th century. Although the sieges during the Jacobite Risings are less familiar, they mark the final major sieges to occur on Scottish soil. The archivist and historian Jonathan Oates observes that there were more sieges than there were battles during the Jacobite campaign in Scotland and England. By the time we arrive at the Jacobite uprisings in the 17th century, siege warfare in Scotland involved less individual craftiness and far more weapons of war. Though the town of Stirling in January 46, for example, succumbed to threats alone, fearing that if the enemy entered by assault, the consequences would have been that our streets would be strewed with the corpses of the inhabitants and others, and the whole effects of the town become their plunder. Despite the promises of the Jacobite army, they plundered the town shops owned by anti-Jacobites anyway. However, the Irish-born William Blakeney, Lieutenant Governor of Stirling Castle at the time and a career soldier, refused to surrender, even in the face of 9,500 besiegers, with lighter Jacobite guns and four heavy guns brought in, some from France, to take the castle, and despite the scarcity of provisions in the castle. On the other side, the Jacobites were hampered by poor weather, the drunken, irascible, he's supposed to be Scoto-French engineer, Mirabel de Gordon, who managed the siege. Um, they, they had insufficient food and horses as well and poor military strategies. Despite being bombarded by mortar fire, no losses were sustained by the castle garrison. With relief from the British army coming to assist Blakeney, the Jacobite army chose to retreat at the end of January 1646. As you can see, we're used to this changeover. <laughs> um, we're now moving to talk about literature. So now that we've considered many sieges in Scotland's history, we'll now turn to siege literature. <clears throat> Our recent book, Besieged, focused on how the horror of sieges during the War of the Three Kingdoms forced literary genres to change. Siege narratives were very common at this time in Britain in response to shock at combat in battlefields and castles, as well as in towns and cities. 
literature had to change to take into account new war and post-war realities. And this book is centered in the late 17th and early 18th century. Today we'll be talking about some later literature. Um, an intriguing example of how literature changed is actually a play written by an Irish writer called John Mickleborn called Ireland Preserved or the Siege of Londonderry. This siege uh, itself occurred in 1689 when the pro-William town was attacked by the Jacobite army who were fighting to restore James II to the throne. This horrific siege lives on in Irish mythology um, uh, because Londonderry, despite all odds, triumphed over the invading forces. This triumph actually made the siege a media event in the decades that followed. And Mickleburn had been a co-governor of the city during the siege, and he totally transformed dramatic form and content to make a sense of experience on the ground in a real siege. He didn't focus, as was traditional, on heroic aristocratic warriors with superhuman abilities and larger-than-life love interests, um, like preceding plays. Instead, he wrote a 300 page, 300 page play that highlights the material reality of the city, especially what it's like to live through attacks, um, counterattacks, and famine. And he emphasizes what practical, tactical skills were needed to get intelligence, to defend against attacks, to deal with threats by besieging forces, um, to slaughter rural uh, civilians who lived outside the city, etc. In our book, we actually call this um, a docudrama because it weaves some elements of traditional plays um, with a documentary like Bird's Eye View of the day-to-day -day experience of war, which is more inclusive of the work of ordinary soldiers, ordinary citizens, and engineers who are becoming increasingly important. So this level of literary creativity often comes from the margins, people who are not playwrights or who are not wealthy. Um, there are fewer siege narratives written by the Scots than the English in the 17th and early 18th century. So we didn't find a lot of Scots um, in that period. But one exception is that our beloved um, William Lithgow, who wrote a true experimental and exact relation upon that famous and renowned siege of Newcastle. Um, he's a, he was an eccentric travel writer, and most of his writing is travel writing. He walked to Jerusalem, from Scotland to Jerusalem. I got tattoos, lots of tattoos. So. He's a very interesting person. And he weaves eyewitness testimony as a royalist soldier during the siege with poems lamenting the loss of a beloved leader and a valiant and brave commander that was killed um, as a result of the bloody butchering war. In general, in the whole of Britain, siege literature became less popular in the early uh, and mid 18th century because most sieges were now taking place abroad, so the topic wasn't as potent and relevant. However, at least one Scottish siege tragedy was written um, in the mid 18th century by John Home, a Scottish minister and former soldier. And you may have heard of him in his more famous play, Douglas, which was staged in the late 1850s. Douglas was so popular that a member of a Scottish audience after the play allegedly cried out, where's your Willie Shakespeare new? <laughs> so, uh, so this is a later uh, tragedy that he wrote, a siege tragedy. It was initially called the Siege of Berwick, and then he had second thoughts and he renamed it the Siege of Aquila, because Berwick was the site of regular conflict between England and Scotland, and he didn't want to stir up um, bad feelings. Um, so basically, the focus of this siege play is the sufferings of Aemilius, who is the consul of Rome and the governor of Aquilae, um, and his wife, who is very distraught when their sons, Titus and Paulus, are captured and their lives threatened when their, their father won't surrender um, the castle in exchange for the freedom. Sadly, for us anyway, um, Holm reverted back to the high discourse of epic and romance rather than soldiers. Um, exploring the desire of aristocrats for honor, stoicism, and martial prowess. Um, and also he wrote on a castle siege again, rather than the city siege, so the voices in the play are less diverse than somebody like Mickleburn. Now Holmes' play in and of itself didn't up inspire an upsurge in literary sieges, but by the mid-romantic uh, uh, period, sieges and literature became popular again. Napoleon the oars, anyone? <laughs> um, for example, the half-Scottish George Gordon Lord Byron wrote the poem The Siege of Corinth, 
Walter Scott composed Ivanhoe, a work that has a siege. Um, English writer Felicia Heeman wrote a long poem called The Siege of Valencia. This is all of the 1816, 1819, 1823, around about that time. And the English writer Mary Shelley produced a siege novel um, called Valpergia. So this burge, uh, you know, this burst, uh, burgeoning of siege literature occurred in the decades right after the Napoleonic Wars, when the nation was transfixed by news reports of events as they unfolded. So even though war was at a distance, um, the creative writers really resonated with a war in which victory came at the expense of the loss of many soldiers from all three kingdoms. This is one reason um, that, the, that these works also, like Micklebourne, disturbed the emphasis on glory and heroism in earlier siege narratives. These authors, like their predecessors after the Civil Wars, deconstruct the literary siege tradition and are willing to criticize gratuitous or unnecessarily brutal war. They question the idea that military conflict is always noble and the belief that past sieges should come to represent contemporary British or Scottish nationalism. So just to give you a couple quick snippets of examples, Shelley's siege novel La Purga fictionalizes the life of a historical medieval figure, the Italian Crastosani, uh, dwelling on the suffering of an aristocratic woman with a very odd name, Euthanasia, um, <laughs> whose who love for Castrosani decays because of his growing obsession with violence and power. The novel depicts Castrosani's descent into ferocity and details the destruction of cities and their populace. For Shelley, Castrosani can't be an epic hero despite his victories because of the terrible results of war in the city and its ordinary citizens. And in Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, Scott beautifully complicates the usual epic or romance features of the siege by having it described by an observer rather than a narrator or by a military man in the heat of battle. Um, a female character, Rebecca, <coughs> uh, actually is looking out of the window during the siege and reporting to the wounded Ivanhoe what is going on. So the reader experiences her horror every single time Ivanhoe persuades her to look again. So Ivanhoe calls for, quote, tales of glory which gild our sepulchre and embalms our name. And Rebecca replies, glory, alas, is the rusted mail which hangs as a hatchment over the champion's dim and moldering tomb. Glory is a defaced sculpture of the inscription which the ignorant monk can hardly read to the inquiring pilgrim. However, so there, there's, there's a couple of really great examples. Um, but we're going to move on to, to now with the rest of the pa paper, discuss one particular Scottish writer. Because no one, no one ever deconstructed the siege narrative more than the remarkable, incomparable shepherd poet, playwright, and fiction writer, James Hogg, a working class friend of Walter Scott. Have you guys read James Hogg? Who in here has read some Hogg? Oh, I'm sorry, read some Hogg. It's tying. Read more Hogg. All his works keep, more works keep being published um, through Edinburgh University Press. So he was a self-educated man, unable to make a living as a shepherd, so decided he was going to walk from the borders um, to Edinburgh. He's, 40, he's in, his, in his 40s with really no contacts or experience, and he's going to build a literary career. <laughs> uh, and he does. So in 1822, about the same time the other romantic siege narratives were written, he published a three-volume novel called Three Perils of Man, or War, Woman, and Witchcraft, a Border Romance. It's a rollicking, violent, and at times absurdist tale, and it caused astonishment when it was published. Walter Scott announced that Hogg had spoiled a perfectly good historically-based siege narrative by adding a strange elixir of supernatural elements, thereby straying from the novel's main focus, which is supposed to be the Siege of Roxburgh. Um, the castle, which we heard about earlier in the Bruce. So Hobb took Scott's criticism to heart and lamented, Lord, preserve us what a medley I made of it. I mixed the best historical tales our country ever produced, produced with such a mass of theatrery as retarded the main story and rendered the whole perfectly ludicrous. So sad. Oh, <laughs> uh, the response resulted in major self-censorship when republishing the works. He cut out the supernatural part in the middle. But unlike Scott, we revel in the remarkable strangeness of this original version, which, coming from another writer from the margins, does something new in response to siege warfare. 
So the story begins with the Siege of Roxburgh, a fictionalized version. And I'm going to tell you the story, and I just want to tell you before I tell you the story that this is an untellable story. <laughs> and it probably took me more weeks to try and summarize the story than it did to, to write the rest of the paper. Um, I'll do my best. So it begins with um, Margaret Stuart, Princess of Scotland, who has offered herself in marriage to whoever can take Roxburgh Castle back from the English. Douglas, James Douglas, volunteers. The castle is being held by the English leader, um, Sir Philip Musgrave, in order, honor of his true love, Jane Howard. So neither man will give up as they want to keep their honor, they want to keep their love interest. Meanwhile, Jane and Margaret disguise themselves as men to watch the siege close up. And Jane, with the help of Margaret, is soon captured by Douglas. The besieged start to suffer. They initially manage to smuggle in food through a river. Uh, but then the route is discovered and is cut off. Uh, there are public hangings on both sides. They're trying to shock each other. Uh, most of, them, of the most of the people they hang are ordinary people. Um, uh, they're trying to use them as this is fear tactics. Ultimately, Musgrave's brother is captured by the besieging Scots, and vile threats are made against his and Jane's lives. Meanwhile, Douglas believes that Margaret has been hung while she was disguised as a page. So. I could give you a summary and just say everybody's miserable. Inside the castle, outside the castle, everybody's miserable. Meanwhile, <laughs> the warden, who was originally named Walter Scott by James Fogg, and he was forced to change it. So he changed it to Sir Ringan of Redhouse, but I'll call him Walter Scott in here. This is the warden. He tried, he's trying to figure out how he can best meet his own personal needs and that of his family. So um, he doesn't know if it will serve his best interest to follow. <coughs> um, to follow uh, Douglas. So he only helps a little bit at first by interfering with supply lines. And meanwhile, he's trying to figure out what to do. And then he's visited by an old man, perhaps Michael Scott, who is a kinsman of his, as well as a magician. And he cryptically tells him via an, a very obscure oracle, he's to follow Douglas as long as Douglas follows the king. And so then he's, that doesn't help whatsoever, and he's confused. So the warden decides to send an odd group of people to Michael's castle to ask for clarification. And this is where the siege narrative is suddenly exploded. Right? So, so this is what happens next. Led by a brave young borderer, like an ordinary soldier called Charlie Scott, this motley uh, delegation sets out. Oh, is it gone, is it gone blank here? Yeah. Oh, it's just, it's just, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. <coughs> Thank you for letting me know. Is it there? No, it didn't happen. Something went on. It's back. Oh, okay. It's good. So I like to see the list because it can be a bit confusing. So um, this motley delegation sets out to Aquid Castle. It includes a friar, a bard, the beautiful female English captive Delaney, a young captive English boy called Elias, um, uh, Thomas Craig, uh, the deal's Tom, the devil's Tom, and Gibby Jordan, who's the laird of, laird of Pete, Pete Stapnell. And they encounter many, many, many obstacles on their journey, followed by an insane um, amount of creatures and events when they reach Aikwood Castle. They, they encounter rats who transform into men, uh, they uh, meet a witch mixing potions, they meet three magical spirits, Prig, Prim, and Pricker, who are, <laughs> who are pages of Michael Scott. See why you have to read this? Um, and they torment the friar's mule in there, do other nefarious tasks for the wizard. And finally, Gourley, who is the steward and frenemy of Michael Scott. And the wizard periodically enjoys persecuting him. So this conflicts and tensions goes on for a very few number of chapters. Um, and then uh, they're eventually on top of the castle. Um, and there's a contest between the friar, who's also a scientist, <laughs> and the magician, Michael Scott. <coughs> and during the contest, the friar blows up Gourley. Like he just explodes with gunpowder without realizing that Gourley had the only set of keys in his pocket to let them off the castle roof. <laughs> um, so now, oh, you keep going, I think it's the next one. Yeah, there they are. Um, and <laughs> so they think they're going to start now. Uh, and Michael strangely tells them that what they need to do now is to have a storytelling contest. And uh, the person who wins will get to marry Delaney, and the person who loses will be eaten. <laughs> and that's how they're going to avoid starvation. Eat it. Mm -mm. <laughs> so the travelers all tell a story. 
Um, so you're starting to see why Walter Scott thought, what is this? Um, the trappers then tell a story, and ultimately Michael actually doesn't choose a loser. Uh, instead, they draw lots, and Gibby is deemed to be the loser. Uh -oh. But, but, fortunately, people are on their way to try to rescue them. Um, Charlie's comrade, Dan Chisholm, uh, is trying to get to the, cast, to the castle Akewood, although he's chased away on his first attempt, attempt uh, by the devil. <laughs> it's just not good like that. So, and then Dan runs away because this devilish creature appears, and as, as he's running away, he meets, thank goodness, Abbot Lawrence of Melrose Abbey with three monks or three friars with him. And he says, oh, good, they can, they can help me. What he doesn't realize is Abbot Lawrence is really the devil, <laughs> and the three holy men with him are prim, prig, and pricker in disguise. <laughs> so with the ha help of Abbot Lawrence, Dad frees the trap group from the castle roof. And Michael Scott and Abbot Lawrence then try to convince the travelers to stay with them. Um, they get the friar, whose holiness seems to be protecting the group, sent away so that they can tempt the men with wine and woman. And so the men become drunk and sexually engaged with creatures who seem like beautiful women, making them very vulnerable, because they're now they're vulnerable to enchantment. Ultimately, though, only the ever-hungry Tam signs a scroll that obliges him to remain at Akewood in exchange for eternal beef. <laughs> that's <what> he <laughs> he's, he's always hungry. Okay, so that's, that's the promise that he stays on eternal beef. Um, so uh, Michael then, uh, finally, Michael, like this goes on for chapters, and finally Michael decides he's going to answer Charlie's question about the oracle. And part of his, what he says to him is, he that drives shall feel the gin, but he that's driven shall get in. And he then transforms the men into cattle, as you do, um, driving them out of his castle along with one of Michael's pages. They run to a nearby house where the friar is lodged. Realizing the cow's identities and unable to change them back, the friar is told by the page to look for hidden scrolls on each animal's forehead, and the scrolls when they're read allow the uh, friar to turn them back into men. So the troop then return to Roxburgh, only to find out that Musgrave, who is holding the castle, has thrown himself off the castle's roof, roof to his death in order to save the capture, his captured brother and Jane Howard, and that Douglas is thoroughly depressed because he's sure Margaret is dead. But still, neither side will give in, and it seems like the brutality will be <coughs> unended. So Charlie Scott and the warden, start with, and a few others, try to decipher Michael's cryptic message. Um, they determine it to mean that Walter Walter's troops should disguise themselves as cattle wearing cow, ox, and bull hides. Is this sounding familiar to you? You can see the hog is responding to the roofs, right? <coughs> um, inside Roxburgh Castle, the Englishmen are starving and they're amazed when they see this herd of cattle nearby. So at night, they creep out the castle to drive the cattle inside, surprised that the Scottish army isn't preventing them. <laughs> and of course, this is a Trojan horse moment, and the castle is captured by the Scots. And the novel ends with a celebration, when we discover that Princess Margaret is not dead, but disguised as a monk uh, who has been advising Douglas. Douglas didn't know, uh, recognize her. Um, she marries Douglas. Charlie is knighted, and since Musgrave is now dead, he marries the beautiful Jane Howard. Uh, the curious Scottish Queen then insists the royal couple and motley crew visit um, Akewood Castle. On the way, they meet Gibby Jordan, who they'd had to leave behind, who tells them there was an enormous battle between Michael Scott and the devil after they left. Michael was lifted into the air and dropped by a dragon and is dead, <laughs> clinging to his magic rod and cloak. Isn't that the best story ever? <laughs> Should be a movie for sure. So we we read this odd supernatural section at Aquid Castle is actually crucial to what Hogg's doing with siege warfare. Here, what Hogg does is he breaks down much of the creative trickery, misperception, deception, and special effects that happen in siege warfare. While in Roxburgh Castle, these aspects of siege warfare are embedded in a chivalric tale that follows in linear order um, skirmishes, attacks, counterattacks, and threats to perform uh, public executions. Akewood is anything but orderly. We see it as a sort of backstage, a Prospero's cave where the magic is made, um, where Hogg disassembles the concept of a siege narrative, transforms and amplifies different pieces of it, 
and then plays around with these misshapen fragmentary pieces. Some scholars have recognized that odd, the odd perversions of things happening at Roxburgh also happen at Aquos, such as you know, hunger and versus famine, uh, on containment on the roof versus being contained in, in, within a, a castle, <coughs> uh, but in a very different way. Hogg certainly reveals the horrors of war in his novel and the way that violence amplifies once combat, be combat begins, just as he is most critical of how ordinary people are dispensable in a siege. However, he's also fascinated by the theatrics of war and how it changes perception. And he also explores, far from the real siege, a mishmash of events that allow Charlie in the novel and Hogg writing the novel to move beyond military and literary conventions to come up with an imaginative solution to the siege of Roxburgh, right? Dressing his cows to gain entry to the castle. Um, there are three main ways that Charlie's experiences at Aquod um, are like amplified components of siege warfare. First, there's the matter of metamorphosis, fear, and perception. Part of siege warfare is transforming the perception of the enemy um, to create terror or confusion. You need to suggest that your ability, your resources, and, and threats are greater than they actually are. We see this at Roxburgh Castle with the public hangings as a spectacle of terror. Deceit and misperception are greatly magnified at Aquod Castle and become metamorphosis. Um, when the travelers arrive at Aquod, Michael Scott Stewart wonders how they, they in the castle can give the appearance of strength, although the castle is almost empty. Michael tells Gurley to call out these 300 rats and transforms them into soldiers, which the steward does. Charlie's a bit suspicious of these odd, musty-like creatures standing by when they enter the castle, but he doesn't question them. At another point, Michael doubles several of the travelers, and each the doubles talk to each other, each telling the double that he is the real Charlie, or he is the real Gibby. So total transformation of uh, perception, nothing is as it seems. Second, at Aquod, Hogg doesn't associate misperception and metamorphosis with chivalry. He links it to a passion for cruelty and bloodthirstiness. One of Michael Scott's favorite activities is having his demonic prig, prim, and pricker perform what he calls the varieties on Gurley. This involves transforming his steward into different animals and then torturing each one. When he's a dog, when Gurley's a dog, he's whipped. When he's a hare, the pages turn into dogs and pursue him. And in these situations, Gurley feels <coughs> terror, which amuses Michael. At Aikwood, therefore, there's a far more intense, disorderly, and demented form of misperception, confusion, and terror related to achieving power than we see at Roxburgh. But Hogg makes clear that perhaps this same cruelty, violence for the sake of violence, is part of all siege warfare. This second point becomes clearer in relation to the Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz, his, his famous treatise on war, which was actually being composed at the same time as Hogg, who wouldn't have read it, but the same, it was written at the same time as Hogg was composing Three Pearls of Man. In the aftermath of the Napoleonic War, Clausewitz explores different ideas about the nature of war, albeit in a systematic form. There are two different kinds of war for Clausewitz. One is of primordial violence and hatred that might become brutal and chaotic beyond all meaning as it is intended to render the enemy completely politically helpless or militarily impotent. The second is simply a vehicle to capture or annex some territory to use for bargaining. The siege at Roxburgh Castle should only involve the second type of war, since it's an attempt to overthrow or retain one castle for the glory of the beloved, <coughs> but it threatens to spill over into the first sort of brutal bestial war, which Hogg unequivocally critiques, especially since it ends up harming the powerless the most. This is mainly because the will of aristocratic men on both sides is immovable. They cannot think themselves outside of the war. There is a sense that the second kind of war may always contain the potentiality to spill over into pure brutality of the sort Michael Scott so enjoys employing against his own steward. Third, at Aikwood, Charlie encounters the creative potential of war. This also relates to Clausewitz, who explains that warfare involves the play of chance and probability within which the creative spirit is free to roam. To Clausewitz, this creative spirit involves adaptability to what Clausewitz calls the fog and friction of war. He writes, war is the realm of uncertainty, three quarters of the factors on which action and war are based 
are wrapped in a fog of greater or lesser uncertainty. In Hawke's novel, uncertainty was the reason that the warden sent the travellers to see Michael Scott in the first place. They were asked to pin down with more certainty the outcome of the Roxburgh siege so the warden could choose the right side. But what could be a place of friction and fog and uncertainty more than Acord, where all that can be expected is the unexpected and nothing is certain? How does this creativity then manifest itself? Sometimes in direct technological ways. The friar, remember a scientist, uses chemical devices to make Roman candles that dance about the chamber in every colour of the rainbow. And then, of course, he uses gunpowder to blow up a leaden vessel alongside a goat skin and ultimately the steward himself. He also uses a magic lant lantern to make it appear as if he has separated a mountain. These and other spectacular events ha highlight the technology of war and the way it gains mastery of terrain by disorienting the enemy. It's this ability to create confusion that Charlie uses when he and others enter Roxburgh through bovine subterfuge. <laughs> But it's not only technological creativity and violence that the travellers discover. When they are stuck on top of um, Akewood Castle, they start telling stories. And to their surprise, they often find they are in each other's stories. So the Friar story makes Delaney realise that he had rescued her from danger in her childhood. Gibby's tale features a greedy, murderous character called Jock, who Tam realises is himself. These creative minglings of fiction and real life weave this community together and it becomes more evident to the reader that it's actually a British group of characters rather than a Scottish one. The friar turns out to be English, as is the bard, and we already know that Delaney and the young boy are English. Charlie, Tam, and Gibby are Scottish, as are Dan and the other borderers who rescue the travellers. Rather than stoking enmity, storytelling creates community. The most significant tale is perhaps Charlie's tale, which is about a battle followed by the siege of an English uh, castle, Ravensworth castle, uh, castle, in which he participated as a young man. As he rode to the siege, he grieved the death of his father, who had been killed earlier, um, a couple days before, in this earlier battle. And he laments the resulting vengeful violence they committed that day, which included burning the castle and thereby killing its mistress. But in the middle of the fray, Charlie and Will Laidlaw find a baby, the Ravensworth heir, and they save it from the conflict. Haunted by the Baron's mother, um, they give the child to old Lady Lauder, who speaks with the dead, and she, in consultation with his ghostly mother, um, cares for him and raises him. And this moment of, of, of sympathy during the siege is quite remarkable, but it's even more so when the bard identifies himself as that baby, now grown up. So at the novel's end, when the Bard and Delaney marry, the House of Ravensworth, an English stronghold, is revitalized because two Scots mortar warriors recognize the limits of violence. Charlie's story suggests that creativity and war needn't always involve violence, but can also include mercy. It also suggests that, I know this is shocking, but the English and Scots have overlapping interests that are far more <laughs> generative than the violent conflict of siege warfare. Therefore, Hawke's novel, before he was talked into removing the Akewood section, asked his readers to step back from the familiar form of siege stories to get behind the scenes where various pieces of the conventional genre were scattered, malformed, and escalated. Unlike Clausewitz, who was working to understand war in an orderly and systematic way, Hogg was grappling with siege warfare and the traditional stories we used to talk about it in a gloriously chaotic way. If Hogg suggests that Charlie, <clears throat> an ordinary Scot, needs to think his way outside conventional methods of war, he also suggests to his readers that they need to rethink old inherited cultural forms as they experience new forms of warfare. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. We're all going to run out and buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Three perils of men. Two perils of men. Yeah.